Morning, church. Yeah, that's right. Pastor Gary here. For those of you who don't know, uh, a really, really good series. We're in the, well, we're, we're getting close to the middle of our Hosea series. There are small group notes or personal notes uh, to be used for devotions in the foyer. Uh, just grab a copy of that. It's about this thick, I think. Uh, but you'll enjoy uh, reading through that. So this is week three. And we've come very clearly to understand the truth about God, that he longs to rescue his people. Uh, we've discovered that the main motivator and its sustainer was and always will be God's amazing and faithful love, a father's love. He loves like no other. And it's been particularly interesting to see that behaviour or poor behaviour will not stop God loving. And as we drop into chapters 5 and 6 this week, we see that amplified. And I'm keen to discover, as part of our studying Hosea, one of the things that kind of gets my interest is the behaviour of the people. How do the people respond? Uh, because I, I'm not a really smart person, but I do know that everybody responds. It, it might be a yes, it might be a no. We know that God always responds. God hears and God answers prayer. There's always a response. It's a yes, a no, or a wait in the context of God answering prayer. But what I'm interested in, in this study of Hosea, per se, right today, is how do the people of Israel, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, how do they respond? How this uh, disobedient and disrespectful people who seem to be really hard at hearing how do they respond? Because the, the question or the relevance of the question is, God's loving, God continues to love, God displays faithful love, unending, unquestionable love, and yet the people, their response seems so empty, seems so void of action. We know at this stage that God is annoyed at their lack of response to his love. And uh, I feel like the story of the prodigal son is a great example of a father's love and how a, a good response eventually actually shows how reconciliation can happen. It's a great picture generating uh, the kindness and the loving kindness of a dad who genuinely loves and that that love is eventually reciprocated or at least appreciated. Uh, ultimately, a story of repentance. You can find it in Luke chapter 15, but this prodigal is messed up big time. Uh, he ends up in a very messy predicament. He's taken his share of the father's inheritance and headed off into the unknown. Uh, the Bible describes it as a far country. He goes through the whole inheritance, all the money, basically through careless spending, very, very poor decision-making. Ends up with nothing. He's hungry, he's desperate. He takes any job and ends up feeding pigs and uh, uh, probably sharing the food that the pigs eat. So uh, the picture that I get when I read Luke 15 is this guy's hit rock bottom. His whole life becomes intolerable. Very messy situation. Uh, I do not want to be at any stage of my life, inheritance or not, eating pig slop just to survive. But this is his story. And all of this was his own doing. Uh, he chose to do life following his preferences or what seemed to him to be preferential at the time. Then when everything seems hopeless, he determines to go home. And as the Bible describes it in Luke 15, just to work as a hired hand back on the farm with his dad. I wonder if my dad would take me back and I can work for my keep. And when he gets close to home, 
This is the beautiful part of the story. He's just close to home. His father sees him. And as the story unfolds around the fatted calf and all the enhancements for a major celebration, the son who was lost has come home. He is found. There's only one way that that story can end that way. And that's the love in the father's heart for his son. True? It's the love in a heart that's full of desire and longing and for a time, wishful thinking that the son would come home and then one day, away down the path, the dad's eyes locks on the son. He was lost and now he's found. I think that situation that made him turn back to his father was totally his own doing. But you don't have to be scraping the bottom of the barrel like this prodigal son to need repentance in your life. And that's the story of the people of Israel that Hosea essentially talks about. And today, any Christian, every Christian has a need for repentance. And especially those of us with a superficial or somehow spiritually shallow Christianity. We all share the same need for true repentance. Some, I have to admit, more than others. That's just the truth because we're all different. And this week in the group study, it takes you to chapters five and six. I encourage you to enjoy digging into those chapters because Basically, they deal with Israel and Judah's unfaithfulness and their need to return with a heart of true repentance. And we see a clear picture of false religion. We see um, what can be described today as religiosity. They were focused on religion more than they were on loving of the Father and reciprocating the Father's love. There's this slow burn in their lives, taking them further away from God. It's hurting them. As you read it, they seem oblivious. And as a matter of fact, Jesus quotes from this part of the book of Hosea to rebuke the spiritual shallowness of the Pharisees. He goes back to Hosea. And it's a clear warning to Christians not to simply go through the motions. It's a call back from God to each of us that we would choose to live in the spiritual power of the Holy Spirit of God like uh, the spiritual power that the early Christians had that transformed their lives, that brought them hope, that actually allowed them to see a future that was different from the one that they felt stuck in. It lifted them. The early church were so effective in bringing change to whole communities. They showed love and demonstrated God's love in ways that transformed streets and towns and countries. That's never going to happen with superficial religion. Just not. It will happen only with a deep and genuine commitment to following Jesus Christ. This is our churches many years ago adopted statement that declares who we are, what we are most interested in. You see, Northridge is most interested in following Jesus, reciprocating the love the Father has for his children. And we do that in New Testament language by following the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And as we follow him, and we've said this so many times, as we dedicate ourselves to following Jesus, the automatic and natural outcome of that is that we are loving others. We love God and we love others. How we describe that here is reaching people. And there's so many dot points or drop downs from reaching people. There's genuine care. There's loving care. There's uh, standing in the gap. 
They're sharing the good news of Jesus. You see, God's call to Israel is very strong in Hosea 5. Very, very strong. He sends a wake-up call to the sleepy Israelites. It's like he says, listen up, hear me, pay attention. This is, of course, the role of a prophet. In this case, Hosea. But I want to suggest that it's our role today. That there are sleeping people everywhere in our streets in our shopping centers in our communities we have a sleepy society unaware of who god is and the influence and the hope and the problem solving that comes when we follow jesus genuinely he doesn't say we're going to when we follow jesus that everything's rosy in our eyes, the way that we would think things are rosy. But what he does is give us perspective and biblical understanding of how things should be and we play our part. As God rules. Sin deafens our ears. A shallow spiritual life makes us hard at hearing what God is actually saying. And let's cut to the chase. It's genuinely hard to know what God is saying some days. Genuinely hard to actually hear what the Lord is saying. And for some, that's a motivator to stop listening children of God never stop listening don't stop listening in some stages of our life it ends up feeling like frustration 101 but here's the thing we know for sure and as we dig into Hosea we will see God is faithful he's given us his word he's given us his spirit and they will never contradict each other never and we also know that god is totally committed to our lives flourishing to his glory god wants us to live well god longs for us to live and uh, we see in hosea 5 that god identifies a lukewarm or immature spirituality that jesus reflects upon in his engagement with the pharisees because he wants them to listen and that hasn't changed he wants us to listen the hard of hearing kind of arrogance or decision not to listen, the decision to go through the paces and put religion in front of love, that was Israel's problem. That's what Hosea is dealing with. Will anyone listen? Will the priests listen? Will the people listen? Will governments listen? Look, anyone, will anyone listen? That's Hosea's cry. And in Hosea chapter 5, God introduces this idea of discipline. The purpose of the discipline is to help them listen and turn back to God. Because when God's people turn a deaf ear to him, then he uses drastic measures to bring them back. It's because he loves them. The nation paralleled, of course, in the earlier chapters, Hosea's domestic life with Goma. Goma, his wife, had committed adultery, prostitution. Ultimately, she's sold on the slave market. We've covered that over the last couple of weeks. She'd produced illegitimate children, but Hosea, the prophet, brought up in his own home and the relevance for us today is that these same problems can keep Christians in a spiritually shallow condition their pride kept them from repentance in verses 4 and 6 their deeds will not allow them to return to return to God they had a spirit of prostitution in their heart that's the description 
They were living lives of immorality and with no moral standards. In fact, their moral compass was pointing south all of the time. There seemed to be no due north. A spiritual harlotry in the form of worshipping other gods, idolatry, and this spirit of prostitution or giving themselves over to another, selling out to another was crippling. But worse than that, just taking them further and further away from God. These people brought children into the world which knew nothing of God's holy character. We sang that song, Holy Forever. Do you believe it? Is there anyone who believes it? He was holy back when this was written. He is holy now and he will be holy forever. And what we mean by that is he is set apart as no other. He has a unique oneness. He is God. There are no other gods. And when we say that God is holy, he is the one and only true God who loves with the absolutely quintessential Father's loving heart. You want to be a good dad? Look at how the Father loves. Children were born in this environment, into homes, spiritually ignorant homes, and immorality was rampant and that's what they grew up with and they knew nothing else. Israel had spiralled down that the culture of the day needed to be transformed, changed completely. Any similarities? Our world, Australia, needs to change. It absolutely needs to turn about and follow Jesus. Amen? So the relevance of what Hosea's message is front and centre for the church first, that we would be genuine followers of Jesus so that we could point others to the love of the Father. Not point them to religion. Far be it from that, right? There's no religion in what they're being called back to. Do you see that? It's not a set of rules that they are being brought back to. It is the love of the Father. And when we love the Father... We see the guidelines in Scripture, not as rules, but as a lifestyle we choose to live by. We choose to live when the Father shows us how to live. Because we're not actually, and no one ever has been very good at doing it on their own. So we need the Spirit of God working in our lives. It got to a point where this word, it's a tough word, but in Hosea 5 and 8 to 15, judgment's going to come. You know, we're, our country is seeing disasters at a more rapid rate than it has in recorded history. We, uh, we are the sunburnt country and, and this eastern seaboard, of course, gets a lot of rain, a lot more than internal. But it seems like our weather systems are a little more messed up than they used to be. And people go, you know, global warming. Well, I don't know whether it's global warming or not. I, my science brain doesn't go there. What I do know is this world is spiralling downwards and we can expect change. You know, and science might tell us we need to live this way, live that way. Just live well and, and be respectful of, of God's creation. I, I totally sit in that um, corridor and I sit there very comfortably. But expect that things are spiralling downwards. I say the same about Israel. You know, we can't pray. I can't pray. Let me put it in the first person. For total peace everywhere. Because... 
the Bible tells us that we're not heading towards total peace. That comes at the end when Jesus returns. Amen? So, yes, we're going to get total peace. You want to pray for total peace, always add, come Lord Jesus. Bring on the second coming. But then the caution is, bring on the second coming, but not until my whole family knows you. <laughs> bring on the second coming, but what about my neighbour that I'm witnessing to? You know what? Just get on with witnessing and bring on the second coming. W judgment is coming. Judgment will come. When we look at disasters, cyclones, whatever, we need to be careful that we don't attribute everything to God's judgment. But we also need to be careful that we find ourselves not listening at all. We're spiralling downwards. God's trying to get our attention, isn't he? Isn't that a, a kind of masked but not, real, not really masked reality of the spiralling down is for people to turn to the loving Father? Amen? When things happen around us, God's getting our attention, but our attention should not be on what media are telling us. Our attention should be on dedicating ourselves to following Jesus and seeing it through God's, God's eyes. God does use disasters to get our attention. Any reason is a good reason to come close to God, drawing near to him. I received a lot of stitches in my shin last year. Um, I was setting a string line and I had a jagged pa a paver uh, that was against my shed and I'm running this string line behind the jagged paver and through to a stake that I'd put in and I wanted a straight line to build some bits and pieces that I'm building in the backyard. And as I was tensioning that string line and I got to the left-hand side of it, uh, and I tensioned it a little more than what I needed to, the string line jumped, knocked the paver, jagged edge, and it slipped down my leg, and there's damage to the door of the shed now because Gary fell over, can't remember what happened, uh, but the shed door shows that Gary fell into the shed. <laughs> and blacked out. And later called Tracy, who came, and next thing we're up at the hospital. We met a Christian doctor. I won't say any more. She's from Iran. It was amazing. There was a reason I needed to be in the hospital that night. I didn't see it coming. While I'm waiting for her, before I'd met her, she did the stitching, before I met her, there's all sorts of things that go through your head. Why did I do that? What are you trying to teach me, God? Right? Life's full of blessings, isn't it? And God will get our attention any way he wants to. And I'm not saying he's the one that flicked the string line. It just happened, right? I'm the goose. Not him. But the goose got the attention. A change in where I was thinking all through that day or the day before or the day before that. But that night, all right, God, feel like we're doing some business here. And the outcome was an Iranian Christian doctor got someone who would listen to her and actually engage with her that she had not found in that hospital to date. Let God be God, right? He is amazing. Back to Hosea 5, it says in verse 8, sound the trumpet. In this case, the disaster was the judgment of God for the sin of the people. Sound the trumpet of alarm. I want your attention. Raise the cry. They need to hear the warning in Hosea 5, 8. And in uh, 14 and 15, to bring them back from their practice of spiritual harlotry and religious superficiality. And maybe this judgment would bring them back to see their spiritual need. God was waiting for them to experience guilt, 
and turn their focus to him. I kind of think this is a bit interesting. When a moth eats an expensive garment, it's really quiet and subtle. And no great announcement. The, the moth doesn't say, I'm coming to get your garment, right? It's so quiet. It's usually in the dark, in your cupboard, and it's usually those items of clothing that you don't need to pull out until you need to pull them out. Don't even know it's happening until it's too late. Happens more in Melbourne because you have more of those kind of walls. <laughs> like a moth to Ephraim. The example of the moth in verse 12 tells us that destruction can be hidden or hard to detect. But the damage is permanent. Once a moth has eaten its way through, that damage is not coming back any time. Drifting into a serious spiritual condition can happen in a way that goes unnoticed, even in our minds and in our life. It can happen, it can be going on for a long time. Like rot in verse 12. It's a slow decay in one's life. You see a piece of timber, it's wet. It, it, it's wet for 12 months. You inspect it, nothing changes. You go back after another 12 months and you put a nail into it, there's nothing for it to hold. It's lost all its hardness and its purpose. Dry rot is how the Bible describes shallow Christianity. It's a bit sad, isn't it? And this is ultimately the greatest tragedy for them, for the people of Israel, and I couldn't imagine a greater tragedy for the people of Australia. The Lord, in verse 6, has withdrawn his presence from them. The worst thing you could possibly imagine for a people of God, or for mankind for that matter, is the absence of God's presence. When it says he has withdrawn himself, that's the absolute, that's rock bottom right there. That's not even pig slop. That's something undescribable. But then there is a call to repentance, to return to the Father. There's a call to know the Lord. And here's the guarantee that God will receive those who genuinely repent and he will forgive them. If repentance is genuine, then God will cleanse and heal because he wants us to live. And I've underlined there some of those key words in those few verses. He's so faithful. He's faithful to heal, to revive, to restore. And when he's faithful always, but repentance gives him opportunity to exercise his faithfulness. Do you see that? He's faithful anyway. He's faithful always but repentance opens the door for that to be active in our life. And the image is like rains to a dry earth. Talk to any farmer a little bit inland of here. Uh, farmers here talk about too much rain. You go inland several hours and farmers talk about when it's going to rain again. They're longing for rain and when the rains come, uh, remember Marge? The rains are coming, Marge. There's joy when the rains come. Because it brings hope 
and it brings change. And the change that comes with the rain is always good. See, what I identify here is that the root sin is the lack of acknowledgement of God. The root sin is the loss of acknowledgement of the loving Father. Because God longs for us to live. The call to Israel was to renew their faith in God, press on to know him. Shallow repentance was never good enough for God. Uh, He goes on to talk about uh, the, the lack of genuine, sincere faith. God desires sincerity. The superficial Christian who looks great in appearance but is far from God needs to return to true repentance of heart. What God desires is true repentance. Genuinely seeking God's heart, seeking God's face is to humble ourselves through repentance and love. And uh, we see that in 2 Chronicles 7.14, don't we? When God is calling his people back. In verse uh, 15 of 5, the turning away. Here's what we need to know. With true repentance and faith in Christ, God offers full forgiveness of any spiritual harlotry. He calls the superficial Christian to true repentance. Come, let us come back to the Lord. He desires that we return to him. It will always result in us coming back to the Lord. Chapter 6 is full of explanations that there was a mist of love that disappeared the moment the heat of the day came. This superficial sense of telling God, yeah, we're on our way, we're coming back, we're coming back. But as soon as the day broke, there was no strength. Their temper had rotted. a deplorable lack of reality in their relationship with the Father. He wants them to live. He wants you and I to live. And the Spirit of God awaits those who will be filled with his power, with his love. And this might require turning back, walking towards rather than away from God said it many times but we know what repentance is in the military when the officer says turn about or about turn what direction do they go the opposite direction if he says turn right you just go to the right but when he says turn about you turn about all the way And as I'm pointing now, God longs for us to live, desires us to love. And our attention goes to Jesus, our Saviour. I'm not very good at maths. I'm not very good at physics. I'm not very good at anything. But what I know is if you want to change, you have to turn. And when God calls us for change and the word repentance, what we know is we turn from sin towards God, the loving heart of the Father. It's your love, it's your devotion to him 
and for you to live in a way that's loyal to his ways, to give mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy which says a judgment is already, we get God's mercy because judgment says we're guilty, all right? Judgment said Israelites were guilty, but God gives mercy which is love and forgiveness in the face of judgment. I'm in. I'll take God's love in the face of his judgment every day, any day, all day. But that's a decision you need to make too. Because the power to do this is deeply grounded in our love of the Saviour. He wants us to give mercy to others. But we've got no chance without his mercy embracing us and giving us the power through the Holy Spirit to love others. Knowing Jesus, but reaching. Can I ask you to stand? We're going to sing one final song. I love Hosea. I love how he was guided by God to script and write. I love how he would have stood and spoke. I love how he was a way for God to expressly talk to Israel and let them know what they needed to do. And then I love the fact that in 21st century Australia, we can open up the scriptures and God speaks to us. Isn't that beautiful? The power of God's word, the reality of his spirit, and never the two will contradict. Never contradict. Trust God's word. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have brought about change in our lives the transformation by trust in Jesus Christ that gives us mercy and that through your Holy Spirit we can give mercy to others. Lord, I, I love Hosea. I love how he writes and I love the message. May we be people who hear and respond to the Father's loving kindness. This is our prayer. Because, Lord, you are holy. You alone are holy.